Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verses 1 to 23. Uh, there's a story told of a minister who not only became concerned about but protested against some unsavory business enterprise that had opened near a local school and was enticing young students to purchase his product. His protest finally led to court action. The defense lawyer did all he could to embarrass and belittle the minister but nothing seemed to work. And turning to the minister the lawyer said to him are you not a pastor and does not that word mean to mean shepherd to this definition the minister agreed well if you are a shepherd why aren't you taking care of your sheep the minister quickly replied because today i'm fighting wolves and paul in this chapter is about fighting the wolves that had come through philosophy and legalism to come and to cheat the believers out of all they had in christ Section 8, Paul's Concern, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Verse 1, the letter here takes a tone of personal appeal as Paul makes it quite clear that his spiritual labour and agony that he mentioned in the previous chapters was not only for Colossae, but also for the church at Laodicea, which was situated in the Lycos Valley. Paul, in this verse, uses a vivid phrase, great conflict. The Greek word conflict is the word agon, is the word we get our word agony from. He uses this word to describe his personal pastoral involvement in fighting the wolves and false teachers at Colossia and Laodicea, who'd come to devour the young converts. He does not stand on the sideline. No, though he cannot be there in person, he's there in spirit, struggling and agonizing in prayer over these churches. His efforts do not end there. He takes pen to paper and writes them. What a glowing example of pastoral care and leadership. Verses 2 to 3. Paul extends his strength and energy so that the believers to Colossia and Laodicea might be first encouraged. And the Greek word here for encouragement means to exalt someone, to meet a, a difficult circumstances with confidence and gallantry. The word has a military background into it. When the Greeks heard this word, they would have remembered the Greek legend of a, of a Greek general who was sent to a Greek regiment who had lost heart and was utterly dejected. The general was sent there because he had the ability to inspire and build courage in fighting men. The general stood before the dejected regiment and brought encouragement. And his words so inspired the regiment that it was though as if they'd been reborn with confidence and gallantry. The result was a heroic courage. They went out and turned back the enemy. In modern day history in Africa, during the Second World War, Montreal, General Montgomery was sent to command the 8th Army, which was made up of British and New Zealand soldiers, whose morale had taken a beating, leaving them quite dispirited and dejected. General Montgomery set about winning their loyalty and building their confidence with an impromptu speech to his troops. Now, in his speech, he did three things. First, he took great care to care in explaining his confidence in his troops and the noble cause which they fought. He then meticulously explained uh, to his men the plan to defeat the German forces. Finally, he instilled pride and confidence in his men by ending the speech with these words. He said, we're going to finish this chap Rommel off once and for all. It's quite easy. There's no doubt about it. He's definitely a nuisance. Therefore, we're going to hit him a crack and finish him. To hit him a crack apparently is an old English term meaning to finish someone or to get rid of him. The result was that the 8th Army was reborn. Every soldier felt they personally knew General Montgomery, that he had confidence in the ability and gallantry to overcome the enemy. The 8th Army went out with heroic courage and after a long conflict, eventually defeated the German forces led by Field Marshal Montgomery. Now Paul, like the Greek general and General Montgomery, brings a word of encouragement to the churches at Colossia and also to us. So there would be reborn within the hearts of his readers a confidence and gallantry in God's strength to rise up and to drive out the false teachers from the church. Yet Paul is not finished. He prays that they might be knit together in love. And the word knit here 
means to be united with an interconnectedness. That thing that connects us together is love. Now love is like the network of ligaments and tendons in the body that binds all the various parts together with an interconnectedness. So we also are bound together. For it's only when we are knitted together in love that we can attain the full wealth of the spiritual wisdom and knowledge found in Christ. Paul continues, In whom are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now there's a story told of the Green Room in Dresden, Germany, where for centuries Saxon princesses have gathered their gems and treasures. Amongst those treasures is a rather a large silver egg presented by a Saxon queen. And when you touch a little spring, it opens up and reveals a egg yolk made of pure gold. Now within the yolk is a chicken. Press the wing and the chicken flies open, disclosing a splendid golden crown studded with jewels. But that's not all. Touch another secret spring and you will find hidden within the crown a magnificent diamond ring. So it is with those who know Jesus Christ. Just when you think you've discovered all the treasures of Christ, when there's no more to discover, in a moment of crisis or in quiet, quiet solitude, we reach out and we touch him. And another magnificent treasure of his grace and personality is revealed to us. Associated Press in 1989 wrote an article about a rare find of the copy of the American Declaration of Independence discovered in a garage sale. Stan Caffey and his fiance prepared to get married and they cleared out their respective garages and sold everything to goodwill. Between the two of them they sold assortments of clothes, bicycles, tools, computer parts and a tattered copy of the Declaration of Independence that had been hanging in Stan's garage for 10 years. Well, Stan's trash turned out to be another man's treasure. This particular version of the Declaration of Independence was a rare copy made in 1776. A man named by the name of Michael Sparks spotted it, purchased it, the document for $2.48, and then later auctioned it off for $477,650. Not a bad profit. Later, Cafferty, the previous owner, commented, I'm happy for, for that Sparks guy. If I still had it, it would be still hanging here in my garage and I still wouldn't have known it was worth all that. The couple hadn't known the great treasure that had been hidden in their garage. It seems that the Colossian Christians had become so distracted by false teachers that they'd forgotten the great treasure that was theirs hidden in Christ. The American Declaration of Independence contains the treasures of human wisdom and knowledge of the equality of all people and democracy. And in Christ, that all the treasures of divine wisdom and divine knowledge are stored. Formerly they were stored in concealment, but now that Christ has come, they are unfolded to all those that believe upon him. And we have no need to explore any other avenue. Jesus Christ is the only mediator, the only source of revelation from God. Verses 4 and 5. Paul continues, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. In other words, let no one talk you into or trick you into error. Paul goes to great pains to assure the church that though he is not with them in the flesh, he is with them in the spirit and that he is viewing their order and steadfastness and faith in Christ. Actually, the words order and steadfast are military words used of a general standing before his troops viewing their battle lines, of a general not only checking how solid the front is of the enemy, but of even encouraging his troops to stand firm in their ranks and not to break loose and to lose their unity, their sense of oneness while attacking the enemy. The metaphor of, re of reviewing troops ready for battle and the reference to the words in verse Four, indicates that the Colossian heresy was not firmly entrenched and could be removed by united effort from the churches of Colossia and Laodicea. Yet you notice that Paul takes no chances. He marshals the believers to launch a frontal attack on this heresy. As he knows, given the opportunity of complacency from the believers, this heresy would, re, would, de, would destroy the church. Complacency towards such modern-day heresies, such as religious pluralism, will be the eventual root 
ruination of the local church. Let us stand united in love, holding a solid front against such heresies. Section B, Maintaining the Traditions of Christ, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. The Japanese introduced a tree to the world that's called the bonsai tree. It's measured in inches and centimetres instead of feet and metres, as other trees are mentioned. measured. It's not allowed to reach anywhere near its full growth potential, but instead grows in a stunted miniature form. The reason for its stunted form is when it first sticks its head out of the ground as a sapling. The owner pulls it out of the soil and ties off the main taproot and some feeding branch roots, then replants it. By doing this, its grower deliberately stunted its growth by limiting the root's ability to spread out and to grow deep and to take in enough soil's nourishment to grow normally. What was done to the bonsai tree by its owner is what Satan was doing to these believers through the false teachers. He was trying to tie off their taproot, their Christian walk. These false teachers were crippling their walk with Christ and therefore limiting what they would receive from God for their spiritual growth. Paul in these verses encourages the Colossians and also us to keep the doctrines of the person and the work of Christ as they are those things that pertain to spiritual growth. Paul says, as you therefore have received. And the word received in the Greek means to take to or to join to oneself. It speaks not only of formal instruction, but of a personal experience of taking something to heart. So the words actually appeal to a person's experience of the presence of Christ that the believer had at conversion, which was the beginning of their new spiritual life in Christ. The word received in the context is a verb, and it denotes receiving something which was delivered by tradition, and something that we must safeguard. Paul, by this word, denounces the philosophies and legalisms of men that the Gnostics were trying to push on the Colossians and tells them that they have received a far greater tradition, which is Jesus Christ as Lord. In other words, Christ has become our tradition. Paul tells us that having received such a tradition, we should take measures to safeguard it in our lives so that the traditions of Christ are not overrun by the traditions of men. We, we are to achieve this by doing four things. First is by living a life that acknowledges the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Paul calls us to walk in Him in verse 6. And secondly, we are to strive for stability in our Christian life. And this is seen in the words rooted and built up in verse 7. These words paint two pictures. First, the word rooted describes a tree that has its roots stuck deep down into the soil and therefore is able to withstand the assaults of winds and storms. So we are to be firmly fixed in Christ so that we are not thrown down or uprooted by the assaults of winds and storms of false doctrine. And the second picture here is of the foundations of a house. Paul says build up. The thought is that no building can rise to its heights unless it is supported by a strong foundation. And if it isn't, it will crash down to the ground during a storm. So the emphasis here is for us to build upon one foundation, Jesus Christ, or will be thrown down by false teaching. Yet that's not enough for us to remain firm. There must be a progression and growth in our Christian walk. What is the use of a foundation unless a building rises from it? And Paul tells us next that we are to be established in the faith. In other words, a believer is to have an unquenchable thirst to learn, to grow in the knowledge and adherence to the truth of the gospel and the apostles' teaching in the face of mounting assaults of false teachers. Just as Paul wrote in verse 3, that in Christ is hidden the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. He now says in verse 6 and 7, he encourages the believer to grow beyond the saving knowledge of Christ to an ever greater knowledge of Christ's person, work and Christ's preeminence in all things. And finally, Paul reminds us that we should be filled with thanksgiving in verse 7 to, get to God, lest we become puffed up in ourselves, forgetting that whatever progress we make is due to the strength of God in our lives.
false teaching and the Christian's answer, chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. In this passage, we have given fair warning against pinning our faith on the short shirt sleeves of men's philosophies and traditions. Now, section 1, philosophies and traditions versus the fullness of Christ. Chapter 2, verses 1 to Chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Verse 8. The passage begins with a call of vigilance against the impending danger. Paul says, Beware lest anyone cheat you. Now, by use of the word cheat, Paul paints a vivid picture of false teachers at, at Colossia. The word cheat in the Greek here means to plunder or to lead someone into captivity. It was the word used of slave traders who carried people off into captivity and sold them as slaves. Now these false teachers were confidence strictors, endeavouring to pass themselves off as deliverers when in actual fact they were spiritual slave traders, thinking to capture and to take into bondage all spiritual weak and asleep. Just like modern day human traffickers who promise their victims mainly girls, wealth and independence, but lead them into a life of slavery, humiliation and eventually death. Paul describes their philosophy as empty deceit, which means it was in vain and devoid of any real truth, power and hope because it was based upon the deceitful, deceitfulness of men's minds. Next, Paul describes their traditions as the basic principles of this world. But what does he mean by this? The word basic principles in the Greek uh, has two meanings depending on which way it was used. The first refers to the mere beginnings of knowledge, that, of, that is of the ABCs of learning. The second meaning refers to seeking guidance for life by stars and planets. Now in the ancient world, as today, many people believed that their lives were influenced by stars and planets. Great leaders such as Julius Caesar, Augustus, Alexander the Great, would not undertake any major decision without first consulting the stars. They also believed the only way to escape such influence was by secret passwords. Now these false teachers claimed to have such passwords. They acknowledged that Christ had done a lot, but in order to progress in life, it was necessary for Christians to have these secret so-called passwords. Paul exposes the falseness of these teachers by combining these two meanings of the words basic principles. He ridicules these teachers by saying that they, what they teach is just a mere beginning of knowledge. It's only worthy of children and not for adults. To Paul, the method is utterly childish and in the next two verses, he sets out to prove it. Verses 9 and 10. Paul boldly proclaims that no other intermediate or teaching are necessary to find God. For in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead. Christ is not a pragmatic manifestation of God. He does not stand amongst the angels merely reflecting the rays of God's glory as a piece of broken mirror would fragmentally reflect a person's image. Rather, in Christ, the manifestation of the Godhead reaches its final absolute truth. It is fully perfect and remains permanent like a never-ending reservoir of water. And Paul uses the word bodily to first stress his point of the reality of the manifestation of the Godhead through Christ, as opposed to a shadow. And second, to remind us of the incarnation of Christ, that he came and dwelt amongst us, as John states in, one, in John chapter 1, verse 14, we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. Paul continues in verse 10 and says, You are complete in him. And this may be better translated, that you are fulfilled in him. Paul insists on the triumphant adequacy of Christ, that in Christ not only do we have the stream of blessing that supplies every need we have in this life and in the next, but we have the very source and the fountain that will never fail. How foolish for we as the church to return to seeking guidance from principalities and powers, the gods behind planets and stars, when Christ is the head in the sense that he is our supreme ruler. Section 2, putting off the old sinful nature, chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. Evidently a teaching had come into the church at Colossia that one could only put off the old sinful nature by physical circumstances. The teaching probably came from the sect of Judaism. 
Paul teaches the Colossians that they have no need of such physical circumcision because their unity with Christ has effectively dealt with their sinful nature. This unity with which Paul calls is circumcision. But it goes on to show three reasons why the circumcision of which he speaks is different from the Judaic circumcision. Firstly, it's made without hands. This means that it was essentially a spiritual act which involved not the stripping away of the body of flesh, but the stripping away of the old sinful nature. Actually, the phrase, putting off the body of sin of flesh, implies dying of self under the controlling and regulating power, powers of the old nature, which physical circumcision could not do. Secondly, Paul makes it quite clear that the author of this spiritual circumcision is not Abraham or Moses, but Jesus Christ himself. For he says, by the circumcision of Christ, in verse 11. The phrase means that it's only through Christ, who is the author of this new spiritual life, that the powers of corruption of the old sinful nature can be cut away or cast off from a person like an unwanted garment. Thirdly, that this spiritual circumcision is demonstrated through the act of water baptism by full immersion. The symbol of water baptism by full immersion is this. The water closes over the person, head, symbolizing the old nature dying and being buried. And rising up out of the water is symbolic of rising in the new resurrection life of Christ. Of, Christ this is, of course, this is only possible if the person truly believes in the sufficiency of the life and death and resurrection of Christ. The act of water baptism does not make us spiritually circumcised, but it does show that only those who by faith are united with Christ are able to have the old sinful nature stripped off like an unwanted garment. Section 3, Christ has done all that can be done. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. Paul reminds his readers and also asks uh, that we were once spiritually and morally dead, but God, through the atoning work of Christ, has broken us clean away from the past. To draw attention to this transformation, which has already taken place in their and our lives, Paul contrasts their past with their present by painting three vivid pictures that show that Christ has done all there is to be done and there is no need for any further philosophies, traditions or intermediates. Now the first picture is that of forgiveness. Paul paints a picture of forgiveness. He reminds them and us that we were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision of our flesh. That is that we lay outside of the scope of God's mercy. Our uncircumcision was like a badge of our alienation from God and spiritual deadness to spiritual things. But all this changed when Christ came into our hearts and God quickened us and made us alive to him through Christ, allowing us to receive forgiveness. Now we so often read this passage and take it so casually. But let's paint a picture before our eyes of what Paul sees here taking place with the illustration of the raising of Lazarus as recorded in the Gospel of John chapter 11. In the Gospel of John we find Jesus standing outside of Lazarus' tomb and he orders that the stone which is sealing the tomb to be rolled away. Then Jesus cries with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now Jesus' voice then thunders with life-giving energy down through the corridors of death and time, undaunted by Lazarus' de decaying body. It then breaks the hold of death has upon Lazarus and brings him back to his body. Lazarus re is resurrected and he comes out of the grave. This is what Paul is speaking of. Our uncircumcision did not cause our death, but it was like a stone in front of the tomb, symbolizing our spiritual condition of death. Jesus removed the obstacle of circumcision as a need for salvation, just as he had the stone removed from Lazarus' grave. He then called with his life-giving, energizing voice. This time, it did not come thundering down a physical tomb, but to a spiritual one, our lives. Again, it was undaunted by the stench of our decaying spiritual condition. Again, it broke the powers of sin upon our lives and we were resurrected in the newness of life through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. 
The second picture is the debt of sin is set aside in verse 14. The second picture that Paul paints before us is the setting aside of the debt of sin in our lives. Now when Lazarus raised from the dead, Jesus ordered that the grave clothes be removed. Paul tells us, not only were we resurrected in the newness of life, but also the grave clothes of sin were removed. The reality of this experience is further impressed upon us when we understand the background of the words in verse 14. Firstly, Paul tells us that the handwriting of an ordinance against us has been blotted out. Now, the word handwriting is better translated as charge list. A charge list is a hand signed document by a debtor in acknowledgement of their indebtedness to someone. It's like an IOU note or a bad credit statement. Paul is saying that before we were saved, our sins were piled up before God like a vast debt, a vast list of debts, and we were well aware of this fact. Secondly, Paul tells us that this list was blotted out or wiped out when we came to Christ. Now to understand this idea, we need to know something of the properties of ancient ink and paper. Paper in those days was made of papyrus or of animal skins, and both were very expensive and could not be wasted. And because of this fact, the ancient ink didn't contain any acid and therefore could, would not bite into the paper as does our modern ink today. So the paper could easily be wiped clean, leaving no trace of the ink. So Paul says that our sins have been wiped off. The debt is charged less with no trace. Thus he demonstrates God's mercy in our lives. And thirdly, Paul says that God has taken that debtor list and nailed it to the cross of Christ. In the ancient world, when a decree or ordinance was counseled, it was fastened to a board by a nail. Paul shows us, or tells us, that when we came to Christ, our sins were laid upon Christ and the debt we owed of those sins was counted out of our lives because Christ paid for it. Now we have the third picture, the disarming of principalities and powers in verse 15. In this picture, Paul shows us that Christ's crown of thorns has been turned into a victor's crown. Praise God. Paul shows this by telling us that Christ has disarmed principalities. And the word disarm means to strip bare or to rob of any further opportunity to do harm. When a Roman general won a notable victory over an enemy, he was allowed to parade these troops through the streets of Rome behind him in a great parade, and they were identified as his defeated enemy. They were openly branded as the Roman general spoils. So Paul sees Jesus as a triumphant conqueror over all those would-be conquerors who presumed to look upon Jesus and what seemed to be his weakest moment, his most helpless moment upon the cross. And yet Jesus repelled their assaults. He completely defeated and captured these demonic forces and led them through heaven in chains as a prize of war for all to see. Paul ends this passage by showing us that Christ has done it all. Sin is forgiven, evil is conquered, so there is no more necessity for man's philosophies, traditions and intermediates of angels. Section D. Guard your freedom. Chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. Epictetus, a Greek Stoic philosopher between 55 AD and 35 AD, said these words, all philosophy lies in two words, sustain and abstain. And this is true of the philosophies and legalism which the Gnostics were determined to push upon the early church. The freedom of the Colossians was under attack from three fronts. Ritualistic observation, angel worship and religious self-denial. And in these following verses, Paul gives the command to guard against such attacks upon their freedom. Number one, guard against ritualistic observations, chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. Paul says, let no one sit in judgment of you or dictate to you concerning Levitical food laws, holy days or other religious obligations of the Jews. A Christian is free from such things. 
In Romans chapter 14, verses 5 to 6, Paul develops this thought and says that if a Christian wishes to observe certain religious days or to abstain from eating certain foods, these matters are matters of the individual's conscience and God. See, spirituality is not established by food, but by the grace of God. Paul has already stated in the previous verses that Christ has delivered us from such bondage. Now, in Plato's analogy of the cave, prisoners are chained in an underground cave, and the only view they have of the world is the shadows reflected on the walls of a cave. Now, the shadows are the reality. One of the prisoners escapes to the upper world and for the first time confronts the sun, which is the symbol of truth. Initially, he's dazzled by it and, and he it turns away, but gradually he begins to understand the, the truth and reality. And he assumes the responsibility to share what he's learned with the prisoners still chained in the cave. He discovers that the prisoners will not acknowledge or welcome the truth. They prefer the familiar illusions of shadows. And when he persists in trying to tell them the truth, they laugh at him. They feel that he's the one who is at a disadvantage in this world because he's been exposed to the light, has made him blind to the cave and incapable of playing the game of interpreting shadows. They vow if another prisoner is liberated, they will kill him. Now these false teachers are like the prisoners in Plato's cave. They prefer the illusions and shadows and bondage to the truth of the gospel. Paul sees the Colossians in us as being like that prisoner who has escaped from the illusion and bondage and has experienced the warm rays of the Son of God upon our lives. And after experiencing the freedom that Christ brings, only a man person would return to the cave of shadows and illusions. Paul continues in verse 17 to say, that for a Christian to be obligated to such legalistic observations would be like taking a step back into yesteryear. In fact, Paul calls the rituals and shadows of, of the body of Christ or the substance of Christ. John Calvin says these words, Hence, a man that calls back the ceremonies into use either buries the manifestation of Christ or robs Christ of his excellency and makes him a manner void. He then continues, For as painters do not, in the first draft, bring out the likeness in vivid colours, but in the first infants draw a rude, obscure lines with charcoal, so the representation of Christ under the law was an unpolished and was, as it were, the first sketch. A shadow of a person is only of some value when you're expecting the arrival of that person. It provides a dim outline of their features. It guarantees their imminent arrival. But once they have arrived, no one pays attention, any attention to that person's shadow, as that attention now is focused upon that person's presence. To be constantly absorbed in their shadows is to deny their importance. The false teachers, by following the shadows of past rituals, were denying the preeminence of Christ. Number two, guard against angel worship and false humility. Chapter 2, verses 18 to 20. And Paul begins, let no one cheat you. And the word cheat in the Greek here means to deprive of a prize or to disqualify you. Paul sees the Colossians as athletes in a stadium, striving to win a prize but their opposition coming alongside of them and trying to have them disqualified in the race and therefore depriving them of the prize. The way these false teachers were trying to deprive them of the prize was through having them to delight in humility and angel worship. Now, true humility to a Christian is a virtue that denies self-interest and imitates the life of Christ and certainly is not something in which we delight or in which we take pride. Pride. Here we see from the second half of verse 18 that humility was something in which the false teachers took delight. Yet the question must be asked, what has humility to do with angel worship? Well, it seems that these false teachers were trying to, cre to create the impression that they were just too insignificant to directly approach God themselves. 
So they sought to contact God through the mediation of angels. And since these angels were willing to do this, and then they worshipped them. Paul continues his attack on these false teachers, saying, intruding into those things which he has not seen. It means that these false teachers pretend to deceive visions in order to assume an air of spiritual insight into some divine mystery. Now, God, now Paul seems to operate the word of knowledge here and states that they've not seen any vision. The only thing that they have assumed is an air of pride which has puffed, puffed them up and filled them with a whole lot of hot air. Paul continues in verse 9 to point out the, their, the error of their ways. He says, not holding fast to the head from whom all the body, which means that they no longer cling to Christ as their all-sufficiency of salvation. Paul describes them as limbs having lost the vital source of life and nourishment because they've detached themselves from the main body and the head. By this illustration, he shows us that the, uh, the vital importance of seeing Christ as the only mediator between God and man. And we are not to be led aside by seeking other mediators such as angels. For if we do, not only do we lose the vital nourishment from Christ, which is vital for our spiritual existence, but we become like dead limbs that are cut off from the body. Thirdly, guard against religious self-denial. Paul says that the third thing for which we are to guard against is religious self-denial. Evidently, the false teachers were teaching that the way to deal with the old sinful nature was to deny the body of certain things. And Paul lists them under three don'ts. Don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. Now, we're unsure what these three don'ts were, but we can conclude that at least uh, two were food and sexual relationships. The verse seems to deal with the handling of unclean things. Paul makes it quite clear in these verses that we have no need of such man-made self-denying regulations because of two reasons. Firstly, because we are dead with Christ, meaning that we do not need to go back to the old basic principles of this world because we receive pardon, peace, and purity through Christ's death and resurrection, something which no man regulations could do. Secondly, these things are related to the corruptible things of this world which perish. As a matter of fact, to follow such things is to live a life outside of the sphere of Christ. These man-made self-imposed regulations do not deal with the flesh, rather they indulge the flesh, because they appear to have a, an air of wisdom, they feed man's pride and will eventually lead away from Christ as they transfer to man the authority of God. The conclusion. The author, Peter Creek, professor and a philosophy at Boston College and King's College in America, tells a story of a poor European family who saved for years to buy a ticket to America. Once at sea, they carefully rationed the cheese and bread they had brought for the journey. And after three days, the boy in the family complained to his father, I hate cheese sandwiches. If I don't eat anything else before I get to America, I'm going to die. Well, giving the boy the last nickel, the father told him to go to the ship's galley and to buy an ice cream cone. When the boy returned after a long time, with a wide smile, the worried father asked him, where were you? In the galley, eating three ice creams and a steak dinner. All of that for a nickel, asked the father. Oh no, the food is free, the boy replied. It comes with the ticket. The Apostle Paul warns his readers about false teachers who were offering them the bread and cheese instead of steak. They were in danger of forgetting Christ's sufficiency and relying on their own self-efforts we who have trusted in Christ for salvation have been assured not only of a safe passage to heaven, but also of everything we need to live for Christ here and now. Christ has all we need. It all comes with a ticket. Praise God.